Hi there folks and welcome back. Today I have one more example for you on computing surface integrals of vector fields. Specifically, we are looking for the surface integral of this vector field f, f of x, y, z equals 0, z, 1. We're integrating over the surface s given by the boundary of the solid in R3 that lies inside the sphere x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 9 and above the xy plane. Our surface this time is oriented inwards. Okay, here's a picture of what's going on. We have a solid region in R3 that lies inside this sphere of radius 3 and above the xy plane. So here is our solid region. S is the boundary of that solid. So S is really made up of two pieces, right? There's the cap of the sphere and then there's this flat disk in the xy plane. Maybe I'll call those two surfaces S1 and S2 respectively. We are trying to integrate the vector field F over this surface S. But since I've broken up S into two pieces, well, we could integrate over each piece separately. We could say that the surface integral of F over S is equal to the surface integral of F over S1 plus the surface integral of F over S2. And this makes sense. If we're sort of thinking of F like a fluid flow, then the net rate of flow through our surface is going to be, well, the net rate of flow through the cap of the sphere plus the net rate of flow through this disk on the bottom. It's the sum of these two surface integrals. So let's start by looking for the surface integral over S1, the cap of this sphere. We're going to follow that three-step process from the overview video. First, we need a parametrization, and we can get this using our spherical coordinates. We can use the vector function r of phi theta equals, well, I have a sphere of radius 3, so 3 sine phi cos theta, 3 sine phi sine theta, and 3 cos phi. Since we're only dealing with the upper half of our sphere, phi is going to go from 0 to pi over 2, and theta can still go all the way around, from 0 to 2 pi. Okay, that's step one. We have a parametrization. Next, we need to compute the cross product of r phi and r theta. Uh, but don't reinvent the wheel. We've done this before. In the overview video, I reminded you of this formula. Since we're dealing with a sphere of radius 3, our cross product is given by 3 squared sine squared phi cos theta, 3 squared sine squared phi sine theta, and 3 squared sine phi cos phi. Referring back to this formula is a lot easier than rederiving it every time, so please make use of what we already know. Okay, the one thing we should worry a little bit about, though, is orientation. We were told that our surface is oriented inward. Is this vector pointing inward? No, it's not. We argued in the overview video that this vector is the outward pointing normal. So we actually need the negative of this vector. We need minus r phi cross r theta. We'll make sure we use that in our calculations. Okay, that's step two. In step three, we're going to set up and evaluate our surface integral. So the surface integral of f over s1 is, according to our formula, the double integral over d, the set of all possible values of our parameters, of f dot minus r phi cross r theta dA. On the next slide, we'll wrap up these calculations by expanding this dot product and figuring out the bounds of our integrals. Okay, here's the relevant information from the last slide. We have the parametrization of our surface S1. We have our normal vector, r phi cross r theta, and the integral we're trying to compute. Let's first find the integrand here, the dot product of our vector field f with the negative of our normal vector. Well, f here is given by 0, z, 1. And if I take the dot product with the negative of this vector here, I'm going to get the double integral over d of minus z times 9 sine squared phi sine theta minus 9 sine phi cos phi. Hmm. Now, at this point, we should figure out the bounds on our integrals. Well, it looks to me like theta is ranging between 0 and 2 pi, whereas phi is ranging between 0 and pi over 2. So I have the integral from 0 to 2 pi of the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of this expression dA. Now, of course, I want everything in terms of my parameters theta and phi. So I'm going to replace this z here with 3 cos phi. 
that's gonna give me an integrand of minus 27 sine squared phi cos phi sine theta minus nine sine phi cos phi d phi d theta. At this point, we have to evaluate our iterated integrals, starting with the integral with respect to phi. Now, this might look a little bit complicated, but a substitution will clean this up real fast. Notice that we have lots of sine phi cos phi terms lurking around. So if we set u equal to sine phi, we would get du equal to cos phi d phi, and therefore this integral can be written as the integral from zero to two pi, the integral from zero to one of minus 27 u squared sine theta minus nine u du d theta. Much nicer, right? An antiderivative of this expression with respect to u is minus nine u cubed sine theta minus nine u squared over two, and we evaluate from zero to one. Of course, we still have our integral from zero to two pi d theta. Subbing in our bounds, we have the integral from zero to two pi of minus nine sine theta minus nine over two d theta, and a very quick computation gives a final answer of minus nine pi. We've just computed the surface integral of f over s1, and now we have to do the same for s2. Now you're probably thinking, oh, come on, Zach, I don't wanna do this again. The computation was so long. Yeah, but integrating over s2 is a lot simpler. Let's try following the three steps from before. s2 is given by the equation z equals zero, right? That's the graph of a function. So we can parameterize this using r of x, y equals x, y, f of x, y, but in this case, that's simply zero. Next, we need to compute the cross product of r, x, and r, y. But again, we're dealing with the graph of a function, so we can use our little partial derivative formula. This cross product is minus partial f by partial x, minus partial f by partial y, and one. Uh, but f is zero, so these partial derivatives are both zero, and we get the normal vector zero, zero, one. Is this oriented correctly? Well, the whole surface has to be oriented inward, right? So the normal vectors on this bottom face should be pointing into this enclosed region. In other words, S2 has upward orientation. This normal vector does give us upward orientation, right? We have a positive value of Z, so our normal vectors are pointing up. Finally, we move on to step three, setting up and evaluating this surface integral. My surface integral is the double integral over d of f dot rx cross ry dA. Well, f is the vector field 0, z1, and rx cross ry is 0, 0, 1. If we take the dot product, we're simply left with the double integral over d of 1 dA. Well, for computing the double integral of 1, we're really finding the area of d. D represents the set of all possible X and Y values. So it's really this circle right here. We have the area of this circle and that's nine pi. Putting this all together, we have a value of minus nine pi for our first integral, a value of nine pi for our second integral, and therefore the surface integral over this entire closed surface is the sum of these two quantities, which is zero. Okay, now that was a bit of a lengthy computation, but keep this example in mind. We're gonna revisit it once again when we introduce the divergence theorem. 